Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what Mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Well, Mama don't allow no modern houses going on. Mama don't allow no modern houses going on. Oh, I don't care what Mama don't allow, gonna love my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no modern houses going on. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio. Join George Smart and Frank King as they talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. Show your support for the show by going to iTunes and leaving an iTunes review or tweeting to U.S. Modernist. Actually, that'd be at U.S. Modernist, right? Today, U.S. Modernist Radio welcomes director of the Eames office, Eames Dimitrios, and the man with contemporary furniture in his DNA, Jerry Nowell. And now, despite years of protest from 11 Pritzker Prize winners, here are your hosts, George Smart and Frank King. Hey, welcome to the show. Do you all remember something from the last century called postcards? Mm. Tom, do you remember postcards? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I used to send them from camp. Right. And when people wanted to win prizes on the radio station, they would send in postcards. And they'd be put together in big boxes or bags or things like that. And that all pretty much has gone away in the last 20 years because of the internet. I don't know of any place where you send in a postcard anymore. No. No. Uh-uh. Well, we are bringing back the postcard. Our sponsor, Greg Kelly of Modbox, has brought in our beautiful orange official U.S. modernist radio Modbox. Here it is. <laughs> you can hear it. It's opening and it's very solid. It's like a tank sitting here. And I'm, I'm actually sitting here watching it. It is as impressive in, uh, to see as it is to hear. It's amazing. And it has a little red flag on the side. Beautiful. So this is the official U.S. Modernist Radio Mailbox Mod Box. If you would like to win prizes on our podcast, all you have to do is locate a postcard of any type <laughs> and actually put U.S. mail on it. Now, you may have to go to a foreign place called the United States Post Office, which some of you have never set foot in, and buy something called a stamp and put that on your postcard. And what you want to do is send your name, address, phone number, and, yes, your email address to us. And send the postcard to Soundtracks, U.S. Modernist Radio, 302 Jefferson Street, Suite 160, Raleigh, 27605. Now, there are no rules about this. If you would like to spend your hours into the weekend making hundreds of postcards to mail into us, Go for it. If you want to win our small prizes that much, you are welcome to. Oh, so please flood our mailbox with and postcards. And George, here's an important detail. Postage for a postcard is only 35 cents. Wow. That is a deal. Bargain. Yes. Because first class is up to 49. That's now. right. That's right. 49? So it's 14 cents cheaper. And if you have any other messages you want to send us on the postcard, uh, we promise to take a look at it. So uh, that starts <laughs> right now with our Modbox mailbox, and uh, we look forward to get your cards and letters. All right. Support for U.S. Modernist Radio comes from Modbox USA and Moho Realty. Are you having a hard time finding or selling a modernist home? Well, Sarah Sonk of Moho Realty is an agent who gets it like you do. She loves the modernist houses that you love with the expertise, experience, and track record to close your deal www.mohorealty.com or 919-601-7339 and by modboxusa.com. Turn your mailbox into a modbox with one of Modbox USA's colorful, stylish, retro, mid-century, swanky, modern mailboxes that complements your home's modern aesthetic and turns mail time into... <laughs> Party time. <laughs> See one now at modboxusa.com. And now here's Frank with the Modernist News. Dateline Canada, this elevator will take you straight up into space. Now, when we say you, of course, we mean astronauts, but still, 
you got to admit, it's pretty cool. This elevator, for which a Canadian company, Thoth Technology, was just granted a patent, will deliver people, payloads, and spacecraft miles into the sky using pneumatically pressured sails. Of course, it would be just my luck when I finally get on the elevator going to the moon. The person next to the buttons pushes all the planets. <laughs> <laughs> they lined Copenhagen. BRK Ingalls needs some money to build that steam ring generator. BRK Ingalls' fanciful Amgar Bake waste energy plant, which will include ski slopes and a smokestack that will spout a smoke ring. Really, it's a steam ring for every ton of CO2 that the plant emits. It's currently under construction in Copenhagen and will soon incredibly become a reality. But in order for the steam ring generator to be part of that reality... The architect and his firm need to raise $15,000 on Kickstarter. They're currently almost a third of the way there with 25 days to go. There is no official name, by the way, yet for the waste energy facility. My suggestion, the poop to power plant. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Dateline London, a 25 meter long, 10 story high suspended swimming pool dubbed the Sky Pool has been planned for the second phase of a new high-end residential development in London. The water will be held in suspension by just 20 centimeters of, get this, structure-free transparent glass and will connect two 10-story housing blocks together. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> two words, Marco Polo! <laughs> and that's the modernist news. Thank you, Frank. Eames Demetrios is the grandson and namesake of Charles and Ray Eames by a marriage and now runs the Eames office, responsible for the Eames brand, which has roared back into the public eye. His mission is communicating, preserving, and extending the work of Charles and Ray Eames. He is also creator of Chimerics There, a global work of three dimensional fiction, traveling the world, exploring stories of imaginary peoples movements, and even physical laws, and then memorializing these stories onto bronze plaques. Jerry Nowell ran North Carolina's first all-contemporary furniture store, not surprisingly, named Nowell's Contemporary Furniture. Hey. He was the third generation of Nowell since 1905 to bring exciting designs like the Eames chair and many other exciting, iconic furnishings to the state. He closed the store to spend more time enjoying life with his wife and kids, and it's with us today right here in the studio. So Eames and Jerry, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, th thanks for having us. And uh, um, th I did want to say that um, actually Charles married my grandparents, not by marriage, but just the old fashioned way of um, being my grandparents. Oh, okay. I... <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, where did they find the time to do that stuff? <laughs> We, we, they rocked it old school. So wow. Okay. I will make that oh correction in Lord. post. <laughs> Nobody's so, ever said rocked it old school on the show before. <laughs> you know, that's true. I'm sorry. We rocked it mid-century modern. <laughs> <laughs> Eames, you have two full-time jobs. You're running the Chimerics There project, which we want to hear about. And you're running the Eames office, which is the HQ for... All things Eames now, even though the two of them have passed away for some time. Tell us about that. Yes, um, I, I do have um, two two wonderful jobs that I enjoy. I <clears throat> kind of look at it in, that in one's life, it's good to be the river sometimes, and sometimes good to be the channel. And um, you learn a lot by being the channel. And I really take a lot of pleasure in helping people see what Charles and Ray's philosophies were about, what their work was about, and um, connecting them to that and giving them authentic experiences. And in the case of the Eames office, our mission is to communicate, preserve, and extend Charles and Ray's work. And this is something that they actually uh, wanted us to do uh, in the sense that, um, that, you know, when you think about it, the chair that Charles and Ray were designing is the chair that Herman Miller or Vitra makes tomorrow. In other words, they weren't trying to design vintage furniture. They were trying to design an experience for, for now. So multiplicity was always inherent in that um, process. And so... Somebody, they, therefore, they had to ask um, someone to make the decisions that need to be made, whether to make materials more eco-friendly, you know, change the glues and things like that. And so they asked the family to do it. And it's uh, it's a big responsibility, but it's um, very rewarding. And it's uh, one of the things I really love doing is making sure that Charles and Ray's ideas are um, achieve the expression that they deserve. 
A uh, quick question about Charles and Ray. You know, the first time I heard of Charles and Ray, I thought they, these guys are a couple of talented brothers. Do, do, a lot, do a lot of people such as myself new to the design field uh, think that? Is that? Well, I think that not only uh, – it... Let's just put it this way. We still have a lot of work to do on that. Um, you know, people are beginning to recognize Ray's role as the, you know, as the, as a woman in their, in their partnership. But as recently as I think six or seven years ago, there was an article in the New York Times about that incredible film Powers of Ten by the Eames brothers. And um, the, uh, the, the only, only satisfaction we got is that when we did call, because we're on, you know, West Coast time and said, what, how could you possibly do that? They said, we know, we've been hearing all morning. <laughs> so at least there was, uh, there was a proper outrage at, um, at Ray not being acknowledged for the, the, the wonderful um, human being that she was. Jerry, you've been in and around furniture for a long time. When did the Eames chair, the famous one with the, with the ottoman, first cross your path? It was probably there before I was. Um, I, when I was 12, my folks started taking me up to the store to do uh, mainly to babysit, I suppose, but I you know, also did some sweeping and that sort of thing. And, uh, and it was there. It was part of the furniture mix then. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it, is, it has always been there. Uh, although as the, uh, the prices got higher and higher, and so it was... Uh, uh, less prominent than I would like for it to have been in later years. Mm -hmm. This is a very affluent area, but it's also, uh, you know, there are a lot of people here who uh, uh, won't let a penny escape without screaming <laughs> and they're very budget conscious. <laughs> conscious and so, uh, uh, and and the, the availability of knockoffs became really uh, uh, easily accessible. And so, uh, yeah, unfortunately, it's made it tough for the, for the real classics from the original manufacturers. Eames, does that uh, classic chair have a specific name? I've always just called it the Eames chair when I pointed to it. <laughs> as long as you're pointing to an authentic chair, that's just <laughs> But, um, but mo most people um, do call it. I mean, the official name is like is the Eames lounge chair in Ottoman. Okay. And and it's a and I, and I think Jerry brings brings up some good good points there. I think that um, one of the one of the challenges is that, you know, as you mentioned, the price has gone up. Although if you look at the cost of living since 1956, which is when it came out, and today, it's actually pretty much the same. Um, it was always an expensive chair. Some of the right. chairs were intended to be inexpensive. This one was not. In fact, I think that actually posed them a challenge from a design standpoint because one of their beliefs was that the role of the designer was basically that of a good host anticipating the needs of the guest. And so once you decide to make a chair – that it realizes that a chair can be expensive, then you really have no excuse for not making it unbelievably comfortable. And so I think, right. and because the other part of their design philosophy was often to work against the constraints. And I think it's one of the reasons it took a couple of years um, for, for, them, for them to design. And so I think, we, you know, with, so with that chair in, uh, in particular, one of the challenges is that everything in your home today is cheaper than and better than it was in 1956 except for the furniture because you know you think about your phone your fridge your tv i mean the black and white utv tv somebody bought in 56 as a percentage of income compared to a high def tv it was in, insane right. and so the, the point is is that we've gotten used to and the problem is it's not a problem it's the good thing is that you know chairs are still made the old-fashioned way you have to make Eames chairs the way they were intended to be made because the making of them was part of the design. And right. it is a challenge for, you know, people like Jerry who are, you know, the, the folks in the field, the retailers, the dealers, they're our ambassadors. You know, they're the ones who have to explain, you know, these things to people and give people a chance to sit in the chairs. And it's, um, and as people today are more and more disconnected from making, and I think it may be a little bit different in North Carolina because I think that there still, there's still a lot of industry there. But you know, if you if you look at you know how how many more how much fewer blue collar jobs, artisanal jobs, factory jobs are the people. If you'd ask somebody to copy a chair, you know, a hundred years ago, they would say, "You jerk! I'm not going to spend <laughs> a week making that chair." Right. And today, people think a copy of a chair is dragging a file from one side of the desktop to another, and it's not. You right. know, it still needs that leather. It still needs that wood. It still needs mm -hmm. the foam exactly the way it should be, and so on, and so on, and so on. The Eames lounge chair in Ottoman, being sort of the classic icon of furniture, is not the only piece of Eames furniture that was designed. I was in a store once, and I remember someone pointing to a chair and saying, do you like that Eames chair? 
And my first response was, that's not an Eames chair. <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out I was wrong. I'm glad you, I'm glad you have a, high, a, good, a good, good group of friends on your side. So <laughs> it'll, it'll help you. So what was the breadth of their reach into the seating and office environment markets and things like that? So they, one of the amazing things about their work is that they there are a lot of ways to kind of judge it, but they did literally uh, at least 100 different furniture designs most of which, at least 90% of which are still in, is still in production, which is kind of amazing right there, as I'm, I'm sure Jerry will attest. I was, and, I was my, I'm just picking my jaw up off the table. That's amazing. <laughs> and, so, and so, for example, there's the Eames plastic chair. They were the first to use plastic. Um, it was initially reinforced with fiberglass, and then we did it in polypropylene, and now we brought it back in an eco-friendly fiberglass. They were the first to mold plywood into three dimensions at the same time. That may have been the chair that your your friend pointed out to you. They did um, they did a, an aluminum group chair. There's actually a new movie coming out called um, I think it's called Pawn Sacrifice about the Bobby Fischer Boris Spassky um, sure. uh, chess match, and Bobby Fischer um, insisted on having an Eames uh, an Eames chair, one of one of the uh, I think it was the Time Life chairs to sit in. And then Boris Spassky wouldn't play until he got one also. Sweet. You know, my, it's pretty, pretty amazing. But there are all the, and then there are many different flavors of these of these different um, chairs. And I actually think the one interesting thing is that your listeners, I think I think it's fair to say that most people in North America have sat in an Eames chair. But the chair I'm actually thinking of is either the plastic chair or the airport seating, which is a very unsung hero of the Eames line. Um, but it's the it's the tandem seating that you see in so many airports, which really really designed because they realized that there was nothing really good there. That was easy to clean. That was easy to maintain, comfortable to sit in. And these are the kind of constraints they like to work with when they were designing. And I get, and I would I venture to say that most people who see that chair in an airport have no idea it's an Eames chair. Oh my lord, there it is. I, I just pulled it up on Google. I had no idea. It's very comfortable to sit in, by the way. But I've cursed you folks many times because you can't sleep in it. <laughs> well, you, and, and you also have to curse the airlines for making you have to sleep in it. So, you know, but, you, uh, our, our design brief can only go so far. It's, it's true. been my understanding that that was an intentional part of the design, and, and you see it in other designs as well, uh, you know, park benches and that sort of thing, because they don't want people sleeping in them. Yeah. So it's not accidental. Yeah, because you don't want to sleep through your plane. That's one of the tough <laughs> things about that, is that if it's so comfortable <laughs> that – Three in the morning, you know, the janitor's waking you up. You're like, oh, darn, I was supposed to be on the red eye. So it, it is kind of an interesting thing when you think about it. It's like do you, you don't want to, you know, you don't want a bunk bed there. You want a chair that's comfortable but that is not, you know, going to let you take a nap. Did your grandparents ever wish they'd invented the Barca lounger? <laughs> I think there were – not. There, there's, no, there's no evidence to <laughs> – That's a relief. We we put it here first, folks. There's no connection between the Lazy Boy and Charles and Ray Eames. <laughs> they would have been much more. They would have been much prouder of inventing the Lazy Susan than the Lazy, lazy Boy. Eames, when Charles died in '78, mm -hmm. and Ray died in '88, about ten yep. years later, mid-century ten, ten years to the day. Mid-century modern was not back in vogue at all. In fact, it was really out. So when did it start to get the public interested again? When did you see that rolling back? Because you would have been about what, I guess about 25, 27 when Ray died? Yep. It wasn't even the the reference to it as mid-century modern. That didn't happen until 84. There was a book published uh, about this era, and the title was Mid-Century Modern Furniture. So uh, it was not only not in vogue, it was it didn't really have not a Not even called that. <laughs> right. Right. That's, that's, that's very true. And I mean, I guess what I would say is that one of the interesting things to me is that Charles and Ray, they, they chose to go to her, with Herman Miller over other designers because they wanted their chairs sold as good solutions. They didn't want them to be sold as high style. They recognized that, you know, they recognized they were displayed at the Museum of Modern Art and that they had this recognition in the design community. But they always wanted them, as Ray said, what, what works good is better than what looks good because what works good will always work. And I think that 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 was that, that even went so far as the way they supported the, the marketing of the chairs. And there was a point when there's a great book by Hugh Dupree who ran Herm Miller for a while. 
and um, for many years. And he said, he got, I remember getting an argument with Charles about whether they should uh, what they should spend their marketing budget on. And Charles said, you know, spend the money on a second quality control center because that's really what you know the brand and the experience is about is about the quality. All, all the other things will they don't take care of themselves. There are people like Jerry who are taking care of them. But you know that hands-on experience that you would get in his showroom. It, backed up by a quality chair is the most important thing, you know, uh, one can do. And so what I'm really driving at is that they were very comfortable. They didn't. They they wanted peop, the chairs to work for people. And so they they were never really. They hardly ever used the term modernist for themselves. I mean, I it's, I can't even think of a place where they describe self describe themselves as modernists. Hmm. They knew other people called them that. They were just trying to do good design. And they did that good design in such an amazing number of ways. They were consummate filmmakers, producing well over 100 films, right? That's right. Yep. Including one that many people recall called The Powers of Ten, which I think was shown to every fourth grade class in America. <laughs> exactly. At one point or another. What started that film? Well, that film in particular was um, – they they were always interested in scale and in the value of looking at things from different perspectives. And actually, Eliel Saarinen, who your listeners, I suspect, will know, but if they don't, that's the father of Aero Saarinen. He was the head of Cranbrook Academy. Talked to Charles a lot about the, value, the importance of being able to look at things from the next largest and the next smallest perspective. And so that was sort of an idea that kicked around for a long time. And then they encountered a book by a man named Keys Boca, who was an um, a, uh, educator in, in Holland. And they saw how this could become a film that would really give people kind of a gut feeling about scale. And one of the things that's really t um, important about the Eames work in general, but especially their, their films and their exhibitions, is that you know the word spectacle is kind of a, an abuse is kind of a negative word now. Like you say, oh, so and so made a spectacle of themselves, and you know that movie was just a spectacle. But spectacle is at its best actually teaches us. It gives us a direct experience of something. We observe it for ourselves, and therefore we learn it better. And so when you see the film Powers of Ten, it's a spectacle in that sense because you get this sort of visceral feeling of what orders of magnitude mean. Because we're very caught up in a linear frame of reference in terms of you know, linear growth, but exponential growth is very different. And they wanted to give people that, that feeling. And so that, so they did it three, they made three versions of the film. The film that your listeners probably know is, is Powers of 10, which was done in 77, but there's a black and white version in 68. And then another uh, shorter test version from 1963. So they were always trying to make their designs better and better, whether it was a film, a house or, or a piece of furniture. And these are available on YouTube, right? They are, and they're, um, if you want to rock at Mid-Century Modern School, they're also available on DVD at our website. Oh, wonderful. But, um, but we, we do have a nice YouTube channel where we, um, where we share quite a few of the, of the Eames films and excerpts from um, some of their multi-screen their multi presentations. The Eames were popular in not just architecture vein or furniture vein, but they were really a holistic pair. They were into everything, it seems. Uh, super balls, toys for kids, such a variety of things. Where did that creative spark come from that just lent itself to almost every avenue of creativity? I think, I mean, that there you really have to look at look at the the people themselves. I think that what they 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 were interested in making the world a better place. They were interested in um, solving problems, but they also recognized that, you know, somebody said, you know, would you, can design be used for things that um, are only for pleasure? And Charleston Ray said, well, who would say that pleasure is not useful? You know, and so I think they had this whole, this holistic vision of their designs from the beginning. I mean, in the, in the 1940s, they did work in all, it, the 1940s were very tough for them financially. Um, they didn't. Things didn't really sort of take off until the very early 50s with the plastic chair, and yet in the 1940s they had made films, they had made exhibitions, they had made toys, they had made architecture, they had made furniture, made beautiful graphics. All these things that we now consider their holistic vision of design. But the thing is that they were walking the walk, even when they didn't. You know, it, it wasn't just like oh they got rich and so they can do all this stuff. It was always how they approached things. Is it? I don't know if this is true or not. Maybe it's a, a apocryphal 
story, but you uh, in the forties did they not do some uh, design work for splints for the for the military? Uh, is this ringing a bell? Absolutely, that and that's not apocryphal at all. That's um, kind of key to the story because um, it and it's a great story because in so basically there was this organic furniture competition and Charles and uh, Eames and Aerosarinen won first prize for it, but they did something that. Um, many uh, designers do today, which is they, they design the look of something before they design the way to make it. And they designed this beautiful single piece molded plywood chair. The only problem is that it was made out of plaster and it was a model. And they assumed it'd be easy to mold the plywood because there were <laughs> trays and other things that were done that way. And so they won first prize and first prize for MoMA was actually getting a manufacturer, which any young designer will tell you is the best. And then, um, but then as they actually tried to do it, you couldn't make the chair, and it had to be upholstered because the wood was so ugly and it was so chipped away, and you look at the vintage pieces, you know, that, um, you know, which are now $100,000, so I guess, you know, I guess something went right, but <laughs> just kidding. Um, but they, um, they, you know, if, if the fabric's off, you can really see the pencil lines on the wood, and Charles wrote a letter to Elliot Noyes where he said, if, you know, basically he said that, you know, I just kick myself that we didn't try to mold the, make the cast iron mold right away. Because basically what he's saying is that if you, the designer, want your design to flow from the manufacturing process, then you have to figure out how to make it. You can't just sort of tell, draw something and say the manufacturer figure it out. Right. So Charles and Ray went out to California, and they were married by this time. They were trying to mold plywood into three-dimensional curves, and then Pearl Harbor happened. And they heard about a friend of theirs from a few months later from a doctor friend of theirs that the metal splints the Navy was using or the military was using were terrible because they would amplify the vibrations of the soldiers carrying the, the man off the battlefield. So it would almost tear the wound open more. So they said, well, we're working with wood. Why don't we try to do that? And as Jerry said, they actually, in the end, got a 150,000 splint order from the U.S. Navy, which was good news and bad news. The good news is that they got the order. The bad news is that they would get the cash after they delivered the last splint. So then they had to Ooh, no. scramble to figure out the, the financing of it. And... Um, and so in the end, they did, and that became the Evans, that was part of the Evans Products Company. Without going into that whole story, but that they had a, but they learned a whole lot about manufacturing and making in that in that experience, which then served. So the furniture was first, but then this whole interregnum came when they worked on these splints and then airplane parts and things like that, and then um, and then they came back to the furniture in 1945. They really were pretty much open to any any opportunity that came their way, didn't they? I mean, weren't they? They were. They were. They they were very open and yet they always managed to keep one of the, here's it's a great great comment you know they, they were open to any kind of opportunity they Charles had an experience in Mexico during World War II uh, not World War II during the Depression where he went there kind of on a walkabout because there was no work he was in St Louis at the time and he spent about eight months there and he was with people who were really poor but he noticed that they had rich emotional lives cultural lives social lives. Um, and he realized that he himself had to stop, um, that he realized that you could live on just about nothing. And th th therefore, he realized that he himself had to stop using making a living as his excuse for doing things he didn't believe in. And it really changed his practice. And when he came back, his, his designs that he did, when the, as the Depression eased a little bit, he did some churches in Arkansas, which are really quite wonderful. Then Eliel Saarinen saw them and invited him to Cranbrook. But the point is that I love that idea that um, as he said, you know, if you do things always for like, you know, to advance the career, but not, but you don't really believe in them, as he said, it leads to all sorts of bad habits. And so I think they internalized this to the point that, yeah, they were living, uh, they were scraping by. Charles worked at MGM for a little bit in the Ford East to, to make some money, but they, but they worked, you know, Ray would talk about it during World War II, walking in front of Sears and looking at all the tools they couldn't afford to buy. <laughs> but they were doing, I mean, how many people tell that story? You know, I mean, they may tell different versions of it. For Charles and Ray, it was, that was, they, want, they, they wanted to live where they could put 100% of themselves into their work and the things, problems they were trying to solve. And so, so therefore, yeah, they were able to, to seize on those opportunities because on a practical level, they kept their overhead as low as they could. And they did what they believed in. And it's not easy. And you know, once the once the plastic chairs came out, that was sort of a home run that changed things in another way. But the, like I said, the beautiful thing is that they were always operating from a pure place, even when that was a tough choice economically. 
On the retail side, Jerry, your mm-hmm. family was one of the first to contest the blue laws in North Carolina, oh, which was yeah. about selling on Sunday, right? Right, right. So were so many people wanting to buy furniture on Sunday that, that this caused a stampede? A- actually, it was the, the law wasn't the problem. My older brother and a friend of his uh, wanted to start opening the store on Sunday, uh, and mom and dad said, fine, but we're not coming up here. <laughs> and uh, um, the pushback came from the other furniture stores in the area. They didn't want to open on Sundays, and that was fine with us. But uh, but they knew that they would have to to compete, which they did. Yeah. Uh, uh, so interestingly, the blue laws were an issue for a lot of people around the state for various products, but it was never a legal issue for us. It was competitors. So there was no state statute saying uh, furniture was evil on the Lord's Day. Uh, it was pretty much evil seven days a week. <laughs> okay. So, uh, <laughs> And you were also one of the first firms to hire people of color at Salesforce and things as, like that? As far as I know, we're the only, uh, we were the first white, quote unquote, furniture store to have a black salesperson. Uh, you know, as, as far back as anyone can, one can remember, black people were hired for the back end of the house. Uh, but when we, uh, a gentleman by the name of Leo White, I still remember, remember him. He was a great salesman, great guy. Um, came to work for us sometime in the early 70s and uh, and many of our friendly competitors, uh, you know, sort of took my my parents aside and said, you know, you can't, you, this is suicide. People aren't going to shop with you if you've got a, a black salesman in here. Uh, and they were they were dead wrong. He was he was, uh, I think, our top salesman for most of the time that he was there. Um, so that was uh, that was gratif- gratifying in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. On the website for Eames Demetrios, you'll find. A 14-letter word looking Greek that's pronounced chimerics there. It's been his project for the last 11 years. Really amazing project he's been working all across the world. How does that work, Games? Well, I thought it would be really beautiful if you could um, if you could visit visit a fictional place and imagine a a a, a parallel world. And I kept thinking, would be you know that we do that for ourselves all the time every time we read a book. And so I thought, what if you kind of made it be a novel with every page in a different place? And I kept thinking it'd be so, you know, it'd be, it'd be this great feeling. Because as you know, you know, reading is a very weird thing if you think about it. Because when you read, most of us imagine the things that we're reading. Um, and yet, if we had a camera in our eyes, we'd be seeing letters on a page. So at some level, what we're seeing is not actually what we're seeing. And so I thought to have that feeling out in the world would be a very unmooring in a positive sense experience. And then about after thinking about it for a while, I realized nobody was stopping me. I better just stop do, start doing it and stop thinking about it. So um, we now have 112 sites. We just installed one in Saskatchewan. And not all of them are simply the markers. Some are bronze plaques. Some are carved in stone. Some are set in concrete. But then there's some of them that are much larger um, installations. For example, we have a 5,000-square-foot site in Paris, Illinois, um, that's, uh, that tells the story of the Parisian diaspora, which I'm sure you all learned about in school. And um, we actually, every year, we have a spelling bee um, where people have to spell chimeric serial words for, um, for cash prizes. I tried to give them chimeric serial dollars, but they wouldn't take them. So we uh, actually do. Yeah. Well, I, I think the actual nation of Greece would like those dollars right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that's probably true. <laughs> do you visit these sites now physically? Eames, or do you do you see them on the web? Do you watch them in films? How does the average person interact with them now that you've created them? Well, we're, we're far from done, and one of the goals is to is to make sure that most people um, are within you know a day or so's drive of the site um, because you know when you when you see one in person, it's a very different experience than seeing it on the site. But if you see one of them in person, um, then that actually changes your uh, your perception of them because human beings are so good at applying context to the things that they look at. It's like when, any, who, whether it's a listener or those of us on this thing, everything in the rooms that we're in has a name. And then once we name things, we hardly ever see them anymore in a certain way. So what I wanted to do is to kind of help people or it create an experience where a story is being told in an environment where you're looking at the world fresh. So there's a Google map on the homepage of the site. And if you go to the, um, those, Places it tells you how to how to find them with the GPS and all that, and then when you um, you know most people will probably not you know um, you know finish this podcast and get in the car, but if they know where they are, 
then you can um, try to you know take a little detour uh, to see them. And like I said, you don't have to see them all because then otherwise it'd just be for people who could afford to go everywhere. But it's more that if you get a chance to see one of them, it actually is kind of this really kind of fun experience, like a scavenger hunt. Even if it's in your neighborhood, you don't expect it to be there, so you actually look at look at things in a in a new way. That is fascinating. Are there any in North Carolina? You know, this is, I, I, there's some in, uh, there's some in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, but we really we need some homes in uh, North Carolina. So if somebody wants to send you one of those postcards to the mod box with um, places that will give me permanent permission for a site in North Carolina, you know, you know, you, they got the they got the PO box already, or they got the address already. So we'd love to hear some suggestions. Eames, both Charles and Ray passed on before the advent of the internet which was, to me, an example of the powers of 10 gone crazy. Mm -hmm. That geometric logarithmic growth and connecting people up around the world. If they had survived another 20 years, what do you see their impact would be on the development of the Internet? You know, I thought about this a lot, and I think that the thing that they would have done first is they would have played. They would have played with it, and they would have explored it, and they would have teased it, and they would have tried it, and, they, and then they would have figured out a, uh, then they would have seen where they could make a contribution. I think they would have had a, had a lot of fun with it. And I think, you know, they actually did a film um, that anticipated a lot of the internet, including paying online and things like that. It was a short film. It, it envisioned it happening more through cable than through the phone lines, but in terms of the experience, it's um, it's a pretty interesting movie for us to look at today. What's the name they of actually it? Did, that's, it's called Cable, The Immediate Future. And they did another thing called Art Game, which was on the first interactive laser disc, and uh, and Merlin, which is a kind of an art a laser disc game. So they were really they they were perfectly primed to it. And that and but the thing that I why the reason I want to emphasize the play part of it is that, that would have been part of their exploration. And I think that sometimes we don't give ourselves enough time to to play to explore something. And I'm talking even on the professional level as well as the personal level. To um, you know, to uh, to look into things. And I think that they they totally would have done that. The other thing that's interesting is if you look at their work, almost all the um, almost all the time that they explored a new medium, it was really just the two of them, Charles and Ray. Like you know, the molded plywood experiments, the um, some of the very early plastic experiments, the early films. It was the two of them, and and they did it partly as Ray said because you know when you have everybody watching you you know, you feel like you shouldn't make mistakes when actually making mistakes is really important. And then they would kind of get a handle on it and then they would, um, and then they would, you know, involve the amazing staff that they have and, you know, a film like Powers of Ten, there's no way to make by yourself. It's a, it's a huge project. But a film like Blacktop, which is soap bubbles on a playground or even some of the early toy films, you really can make, you know, with just a, um, a couple of people and that's how you learn. And I think that, play, so I think the play would have been part of it and I think their minds would have been, um, you know, very suited to what the um, the internet had to offer. They even made a film called The Communications Primer, which basically said the age of information is coming. Architects and designers need to know more about communications theory to have an impact. It sounds really dry in a way, but it's a very fun film. And although Charles and Ray were designers, major corporations like Westinghouse, Boeing, Polaroid, and IBM all hired them to shape the public's perception of digitization and computers which were coming in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Yeah, and they also hired them to, they also wanted them to advise about, they wanted access to their brains. I mean, that communications primer film I mentioned, they, uh, was actually where I took the name of the book I wrote on them, an Eames primer, because it was just, it was just like this basic film that they wanted to make. But here's the thing, they didn't have a client for it. They just made it. And that goes back to that experience in Mexico I was mentioning. They just made the film. And then once they made it, they started showing it to people. Then IBM saw it and said, we want to work with these people. And then they were hired by IBM. If they had tried to, and this I think is important for you know, people who are just starting out now, if they had said, okay, we want to make a resume piece that will sell how cool we are and how smart we are, it would never have worked. Instead, they, always, they, 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 they looked in themselves, they, they, um, they, but they looked in the universal part of themselves to, to make this work, and then it did connect with people. Hey, Jerry, I got two questions for you. Yes, sir. I have a very vivid memory of blue laws. I can remember my mother saying, 
uh, to somebody, another adult. There's a furniture store here in town trying to get around the blue law by selling a banana and giving away a couch. Um, <laughs> was that was that was that uh, Nals? Was that uh, your? I would love to say that it is, uh, and and I will say that even though I don't know anything about it. <laughs> that, boy. that was us. Yeah, uh, if it was cool, we did it. Okay. The second question is, and I know this because I lived in the Triangle off and on over the last fifty-eight years. You are a five-time now is your store a five-time winner of Metro Magazine's Reader's Poll as the best place to buy contemporary furniture, which sounds great. However, in '68, when your store made the switch, weren't you also the only store in the area for a we, long time? Well, that was long before Metro Magazine even existed. But uh, we, um, yeah, we were the we were the First switch over to all contemporary in '68, and I guess the next store came along in uh, within the next couple of years. Um, but there is nobody. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, we we were there before anybody else, um, and we I think we won more than five. And I know with uh, Ind the Independent magazine and also uh, Spectator, Independent coming on, and then Spectator, we uh, we usually won the the Furniture Store of the Year awards almost every year. So. Um, in fact, we even won a um, uh, one of the best 100 small businesses from uh, uh, Business Leader one year. So, wow. and yeah. Jerry, I can tell you that your store is really missed. Well, thank you for saying that. Well, and Jerry, I actually had a question for Jerry too because we we you know both sort of grow, grew up with the, these designs. And when you were when you were growing up, did you ever have a feeling that did it all feel really natural to you, or did you know did your friends make sure they knew that you knew that this was unusual work? I was just curious, like what what that part of the story was for you. Uh, yeah, I guess in some ways it was similar, and and, and other ways different. I, I suppose um, I was. Uh, it seemed normal to me, but my my friends sort of thought it was. They would come over to the house and they'd see the furniture we had, and and. Um, and they just thought it was kind of a playground, uh, you know, unusual <laughs> space, space age things. You know, we could all pretend like we were the Jetsons. Um, and uh, yeah, so there was a, it seemed very normal to me, though. Well, I want to thank our guests today, Eames Dimitrios and Jerry Nowell. You guys were great. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Sarah Sonk, the real estate agent who loves modernist houses just as much as you do. 919-601-7339. And my modboxusa.com and their colorful, stylish, retro, mid-century modern mailboxes just like this great orange one sitting right in front of me. Thanks for listening. I'm George Smart with Frank King. Take us out, Tom. Glad to. Visit U.S. Modernist Radio on the web at usmodernistradio.org for links about people and buildings mentioned today on the show. We record at Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song is performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Follow us on Twitter at, at US Modernist or email us at comments at usmodernistradio.org or mail those postcards to US Modernist Radio Care of Soundtracks, 302 Jefferson Street, Suite 160, Raleigh and C, 27605. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of North Carolina Modernist Houses, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. George and Frank and I'll be back in two weeks for another locally sourced, organically grown, socially conscious, <laughs> GMO-free, fair trade edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. <laughs>